Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our fireside chat with Dr. Donna Strickland. I'm a graduate from McMaster's engineering physics class, 1981. Also received an honorary doctorate degree from McMaster in 2019. And of course, the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2018. So we are gathered here at the beautiful L.R. Wilson, Wilson Hall in the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Lampoon Agreement to celebrate the naming of the two streets on campus, Strickland Way and Shoals Way. Um, and they'll be joining the Brock House Way in recognition of the Master's Noble Laureates. We're thrilled to have this opportunity to welcome you um, and have this conversation with you as well. Unfortunately, Dr. Scholz is unable to join us today, but we are going to be showing some videos um, with him and then later on. And to introduce myself, um, as I was mentioned earlier, I'm an engineering alumni. I did the chemical and biomedical engineering program here at McMaster. Um, and now I'm a first year medical student at the University of Toronto. And I'm Shana Earl. I am in my fourth year of chemical and biomedical engineering here at McMaster. And I'm also one of the presidents of the McMaster Women in Engineering Society. So just a little bit about our format here today. In preparation for today's chat, we solicited the McMaster community via social media, as well as in the registration for this event to collect some questions that people have for Dr. Strickland. So thank you to everybody who asked a question. So we've done our best to select the most frequently asked questions as unfortunately we will not be able to get to all of them. But if you don't hear the answer to your question, you'll have the opportunity to ask it directly during the open mic portion of this event in the second half of our time today. At that time, we will invite you to come forward to one of the mics uh, and introduce yourself as well as briefly ask your question. We will we'll also be seeing some of the recently taped interviews that alumni director Karen McQuig uh, had with Dr. Scholes as well as Dr. Strickland and we'll be showing them later this afternoon. And now we'll get started. Awesome, so for our first question, just making sure this is tight enough. Okay. As one of the three women to receive the Nobel in physics, you're a role model for women in STEM. In your recent interview, you mentioned you see progress in the gender balance in STEM, but we asked for you to speak about, um, or you know, you said, sorry, that we should speak more about feminism in a positive way. Is that as best to encourage women? Can you please elaborate on how you think this conversation might be improved? Well, my only concern about the way so much of feminism is talked about is all the negativity. And I don't see how that can, you know, would make a young girl think, oh, then this is what I want to do. And so I, I, that's what I'm a little bit nervous about. And I think that we have made strides. And so I'm not saying we're in a perfect space yet. And so obviously there's still work to be done. But I think that we should also see the accomplishments of what's happened over the years, right? between, you know, Marie Curie would not have won the Nobel Prize if her husband had not said, I won't win it unless she does, right? And so again, it was a man that stood up and it is always the people in power that must stand up for the people who don't have the power. Um, and so I welcome, you know, everybody that has the power to, to push for it. Uh, but I, I think that we should always be pointing out anytime we say that there's a problem, a, there should be a suggestion of how to improve it, but also to say it is still better than it was so that we know that we're always marching forward. Uh, I talked about Maria Gopa Mayer and how she did not, it was just before she started doing a Nobel Prize winning work in her 50s that you know she was finally paid as a scientist, right? She followed her husband and she was allowed to be a secretary and I think she got paid for that. And then half the time she was allowed to stay in the office to do her theoretical physics, but she was not considered a physicist or paid to do that. And yet she was doing Nobel Prize winning work and even as a grad student, she did something that made a whole new field of physics start. So she was a remarkable, remarkable scientist. So obviously things have changed quite a bit since I've always been paid to do my job. That's, that's great to hear. Um, so a few students wanted to ask along similar lines if you've ever experienced imposter syndrome and then how you manage that. I experienced imposter syndrome far more since winning the Nobel <laughs> Prize than before um, because I think people now expect me to have answers to just about all questions and it's not possible. And so, and people all of a sudden think you're much smarter than you are, right? You have to remember that the work I've been uh, credited with was done 35 years ago. And I went through those 35 years without everybody thinking, oh, she's so smart. And then all of a sudden you think, oh, she's so smart. Um, so obviously one just pushes through. And, uh, you know, obviously I just let people think I'm smart. Um, <laughs> and before that though, I, th I think, um, 
although I, I did always wonder if I belonged. Eventually, I just worked through it and realized I did belong. So I was always fine with it in the long term. Do you find that it's also still like this continuous reminding yourself where now it's kind of set? <laughs> no, and I you. think over the years what becomes, because I think a lot of women feel they have it more than the men do. And I have to keep letting women know, no, men are told to have bravado, but bravado is not the same thing as confidence. I think men and women are probably equally confident. It's just that men are not even allowed to show that they aren't, and women are allowed to say they're not. Mm -hmm. And so again, you can look at everything from both sides, and it can't be any easier on the other side. And you should never confuse bravado with confidence. Amazing. Um, okay, so the next question is, what are, in your opinion, the top three skills that students and alumni should work on that will help them to excel in their career? I'll give you a second to think about that if it doesn't come. Well, the first one is patience. patience. I think it more so as an experimentalist, one has to have a lot of patience. Your equipment's breaking down, things aren't working, but, but this is true in science. I mean, I have, I have theory friends who will say that, of course, their theories don't come together either because they try and it doesn't work. Uh, and so I think that's true of science, it's probably true of many things, that you need patience. Um, obviously, you, you need to have love for what you do. That's what makes you work hard. I don't believe in saying just work hard, because you know if you don't really love it, you can work hard for a short period of time, but you're gonna just give up, because where's the fun in that? Um, so it has to be fun. Uh, and so you need patience and fun. And I also think you have to remember that even though science seems like it's an individual thing, it really is a team sport. I think, especially when you're struggling, you want to have somebody to bounce your ideas off of um, and see what comes back at you from them and hear their ideas and see what that springs in your mind. And this is how science really gets moved forward. So you want to always remember it's a team sport. It's very clever. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess this ties into the patience piece, but how do you deal with personal dissatisfaction that arises from your work? And how do you stay the course and be resilient in the face of that? Uh, I always go for a walk. Uh, and, I, and I do tell stories about my daughter all the time, but one time she was so sure she was going to fail a midterm and she was in physics undergrad. And I said, no, you're not, but you've got yourself wound up too tight. Go for a walk. She was at Miguel and I said, just go for a walk up the mountain. And she refused to believe me. I said, no, that's what you're going to do too. No, there's no time. The exam's tomorrow. And I go, it doesn't matter. Um, and she was, you know, afterwards we reconvened and uh, she was, you know, calmer and it was right. So. Um, there are many times when I have felt like kicking my laser because it just would not do the right thing, but you can't kick it because that would not help it do the right thing. Um, and so then I know it's time for a walk. I'm a huge fan of walking too. <laughs> um, awesome. Okay. Um, so thank you for the responses so far. We're just going to switch our focus um, to the screen here and watch a video of Dr. Scholes and Dr. Strickland um, and their reflections on winning the Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. I always tell people when they ask me about it, I say, if you have the opportunity to receive the award, do not turn it down. It was a great, very great experience because, uh, you know, between the, uh, the combination of pomp, you know, and, and, and ceremony, and then they also have uh, academics or giving talks. So there's the idea of academic excellence. And then there's frivolity. So they have students who hold pageantry and parties in that which you attend. And so uh, the combination of the three make it terrific between the uh, royal family showing up to uh, hand out the degree at the uh, uh, opera house to uh, the dinner at the town hall thereafter you know, and then dancing and the like, and then uh, the uh, and the ceremony was great. When I was uh, spoiled because they give you a driver and a cachet to take you around Stockholm, and, and so you feel uh, great in that. And the only thing when I got home and I got into the back seat of my car to go to the grocery store, it didn't go anywhere. So I was kind of. <laughs> I was disappointed about that. It's sunk in by now. Um, you are in a daze the whole first day because you just don't know what the heck is happening to you. It's it's so life changing. And um, 1,500 emails came in that day. But just at like 7:30 in the morning, um, I was having my um, ensuite bathroom redone. So the plumber was there saying he wants to shut the water off. My neighbor was there with a lovely bouquet of flowers. I had a Reuters photographer there and I had Globe and Mail on the phone. And it was all just like, what? what's going on? <laughs> so it's just, yeah, and it was nonstop that first day. Um, so it was just crazy.
I was always in high school, I started off with one passion that I had when I was from a young time, a young person, uh, was to try to understand uncertainty. You know, and uncertainty was really the thing I was most interested in. And, uh, and so that would lead you, if you think about uncertainty, how does everyone tend to handle uncertainty? And so economics was where I decided to focus my attention to try to understand uncertainty. I mean, you could have done it in religion, you could have done it in philosophy, sociology, you know, physics, or any of the other sciences that you want to take. I just thought that economics, which was important to me because of the dynamics or changes that I saw in society that were occurring all the time, would lead to uncertainty and more uncertainty and changes. And so that way I needed to garner better mathematics and statistics. And I had to really understand how others had studied uncertainty. I mean, obviously war and war activities, if you read about history and that, is really uncertainty personified because everything is compressed in such a short period of time and all plans that you have are entirely changed because of shocks and the like and so i did a lot of reading in history and uh, and uh, and as well to try to understand my thinking or trying to build a, a model or thinking about how others addressed uncertainty and when i then got to graduate school at the university of chicago i was lucky enough to associate with those who were thinking about the use of statistics and modeling in finance, which is also a very uh, uncertain area in terms of how uncertainty unfolds. So that you know, it was like really this foundation that I had. Somewhere I got the idea that trying to understand uncertainty was something that I was very puzzled about and wanted to grow from there. You know, I really like math. Math is probably my favorite subject. Um, and I looked at it like a puzzle. I remember trig identities finally in sort of grade 13 physics. I'm just thinking those were the coolest things. They were just to me even more like a puzzle. And I always thought physics in the same way was like a puzzle to, to be solved. And, and you know, whether it's a crossword puzzle or Sudoku, I still like puzzles. Um, and so, yeah, but physics made sense to me. And so um, I just, yeah, just sort of got it. So I thought about it and um, I liked it. That was a great video. So I guess we'll just continue on with lots more questions for you. Okay. Um, so you briefly touched on it here, but how has receiving the Nobel Prize impacted your life, your career, and just everything since then? Well, it's obviously changed my life quite a bit. Um, it's also changed my research quite a bit because I'm not in the lab. I used to like going down to the lab if I was you know, there not teaching. I was in the lab working with the students quite a bit, and that's just not happening anymore. Um, and then I do get to do amazing things. I do a lot of uh, talks to people. Uh, I give a lot of talks. I've probably given my Nobel talk a hundred times now. Um, and, uh, but also I've, I've had some amazing experiences like meeting the Pope. I've had a, an audience with the Pope. Uh, Gerard helped set that one up. Uh, we were just talking about going to the French embassy in Rome and having um, a dinner and actually, Michelangelo actually did that ceiling too. So most people do not even get to go in the standing room there. We're sitting under another Michelangelo uh, ceiling that most people don't even know about. Um, when I was at, with the Pope, we actually got taken down into the basement of the Vatican and shown how they restore their art, which is something most people do not get to do, but we get to, you know, Nobel Lords get to do that. Um, so I've had just these kinds of remarkable experiences that just you don't get unless you win something like a Nobel Prize. <laughs> incredible um do you have a favorite <laughs> out of all the things they've done is there like a favorite moment or like a, this is this is it <laughs> or would you say it's like summation of all oh no there's a lot you know i really enjoyed sitting beside the king i was the one who got to sit beside the king on the uh, nobel banquet and i really enjoyed that and i really enjoyed the next uh, day sitting with his son who i would say is the epitome of a prince charming and he was um <laughs> So I quite enjoyed that. And that was in this like golden dining room. Wow. As my husband keeps saying, the person that um, helped usher us in just, yeah, just another Tuesday night at the palace. Um, <laughs> so there's those fairy tale moment kind of parts to it. Um, but I've also met uh, the rock star, Stephen Tyler and, and Brian May. So, you know, that's amazing too. That is amazing. Awesome. Okay, so next question. 
Um, how does one go about asking questions about one's own research that you know can lead to inter interesting results? Um, could you maybe highlight that process for you and kind of what goes through you know your mind when solving a problem? Well, I've been trying to solve the same problem for quite a few years in my lab, and uh, the point was it was actually uh, a Russian um, person that contacted me because I had built this laser that he thought would be the perfect thing to study his um, area of research, and that's mostly what I do. I build uh, lasers that other people don't have and hope that somebody wants to use them. Uh, so I certainly said, come on over and let's use it. Um, and it was the idea of making a whole series of colors. And if you make a lot of colors, that should help you make a short pulse. Um, but the colors have to be um, pretty well prescribed. So when we went ahead and did the experiment, and actually we were still doing it after the Russian left, um, for all of the uh, colors that we saw, we saw these extra ones. And my grad student at the time said, what do you think those are? And I went, I have no idea. We should figure out what the heck those things are. And so we've been trying to figure out what the heck those things it may not be useful at all, but it was just worth knowing. But also from a practical point of view, uh, we've made all of these colors and we would like to turn them into short pulse. And um, it's not really um, easy to do. And it's because we have to figure out what those other colors are because they're sort of in, in the way. And we have to be able to okay. form them. So I guess another research-based question, but what would you say the ideal balance is between pure and applied research? Should we lean more heavily on research that has a societal impact? Or what do you no, think? Uh, I, I don't think so. <laughs> um, I also think that you can't tell which ones are gonna have societal impact. So there's, there's a lot of uh, famous stories, but you know, NMR, it was 50 years between the people who first developed nuclear magnetic resonance until it was in the hospital and not allowed to use the word nuclear, so it became magnetic resonance imaging. So that took 50 years, right? It was Albert Einstein just trying to figure out how light and matter interacted in 1917 that brought us the laser in 1960. He certainly wasn't thinking, oh, gee whiz, I, I, if I think about this, I bet you we can make a laser out of it. No. Um, he just thought we have to understand it. Uh, and so, but on the other hand, and usually when I'm giving uh, my Nobel talk, I do point out that it was this basic understanding of um, optics that brought us the laser. But when the laser came along and the intensity got so high, it changed how light and matter interacted. And then, you know, so we started studying nonlinear optics, and, which is what I was trying to do. But, uh, you know, our laser got so intense, we went even beyond that, and it changed again how light and matter interacted. So one brings you new technology, and new technology lets you probe deeper into science. And I think they go hand in hand. There's no reason to say you should do one or the other. We need to do it all. Wonderful. Amazing. OK, so a little more, I guess, of a fun question. If you, would, um, if you were to write a book about your entire academic and career trajectory, what would it be called? And what would it be called? That's good, because I would never write the book, because I hate writing. What would it be called? Uh, fun in the lab. Okay, um, so we're gonna take a quick pause with asking questions, and um, we're going to head our attention back to the screen <laughs> for another video. The only advice I would give, and I gave it, I remember as a grad student to younger grad students, is that, and it sort of came up. Um, I was the seventh one in Gerard's group, and it was, that's about the size of the group. And, and we ballooned by the time I left to about 30, right? There was just a lot of people taking, working with them, and not all of them seemed to love it. But I'll have to tell you, the seven of us that started in a certain group before me, I mean, you could just tell they really loved what they were doing, and I loved what I was doing. And, and um, that's, what, that's my advice. You gotta love what you're doing. In that way, you work really hard. You know, when I'd ask some of the other students who joined, I went, you don't seem to really love this. Why are you doing it? Why are you working for Gerard in, in, in this field? And they go, oh, there's so many laser jobs right now. And I go, yeah, but you know, we take like seven years to get our PhD. You don't know what the job market's gonna be. So you shouldn't pick something based on a job market. Cause like, why do you wanna do a job for your whole life that you don't really love? And it's hard to, to really put your heart and soul in it and do a really excellent job unless you love it. So that's, that's the only thing that I say is that you really should love it. What creativity is important. So that what one could do is to keep in a straight and narrow and don't deviate from a lot of other things. And there in life there is researching, researching again what others have done, which is a great way to move forward in life. But there's also think about the times in which you want to search or you want to be more aggressive in what you do and take risks in what you do. 
to achieve your dream. And so I think that in my case, you know, maybe I could have been burned to death, but I also at the same time was lucky in that when I did search for a new area because I was interested in the topic, you know, I discovered things that were deemed to be very valuable in the profession. So that what the message is that yes, learn all you can is the basis of what you need to move forward, but also to be curious and look to your right and look to your left and find new things to search that may add value for you and for the others around you and for society generally. You know, obviously you're proud of your papers, you're proud of your students, you're proud of the idea that you're con contributing to other people. And I think when you're an academic, or that's what you start off to be, you, you have a, a philosophy of giving, you know, so being able, if you're not going to, if you want to make, just make money, you wouldn't necessarily go into academics. It wasn't I was paying profession at the time that I graduated. Basically, there's two things that I enjoyed about academics. It's, one is that you were a hunter because you were always hunting for things that are unique, you know, and different. But also, you're a farmer because you have to bring in and train people you know, how to be the next generation and you have your students and you see their eyes opening up and you're setting a tone for them to move forward. So, you know, in the, in the Buddhist philosophy world of things, you're taking for yourself, but you're also giving to students. And so this idea of being a hunter and a farmer simultaneously uh, and uh, is something that was very wonderful about the whole profession. And, you can give to your, you have to marry, however, when to be a hunter, which is be very into yourself and alone, and then when to be the farmer, which you're trying to work, farm the mines and make and broad knowledge and help people take the next steps in their careers. Um, but I also, you know, I probably am proudest and will always be proudest of CPA, even though I was the student and not the uh, professor that came up with the idea. I have my picture behind me of Alexander Graham Bell. And he was, you know, when they, this is my grand, uh, husband's grandfather that did the bust. And, and there's the story that goes with it that, you know, the kids didn't like this bust, made him look like an angry old man. And he said, I am an angry old man, or grumpy, not angry, grumpy old man. And, uh, now, I don't know if he's the one who said it or just the newspaper read into it, but he just was upset that he never taught the telephone. And I, that's why I sit here. I go, I'm never going to be grumpy that I don't talk CPA. You know, you can't do something that big and then hope to keep achieving that. So, but you know, I've had other moments when uh, Paul and I were both trying to figure something out. And at one point, you know, I thought I needed to do a computer model to show him that my, my idea was right. And I did it, which and I don't even like going near a computer. Um, and so uh, when I showed it to him, I remember just being really proud because he's such a smart guy and, and, you know, figures out so many things. But there was the one time I got uh, something ahead of him. So um, there's other times like that. I still, uh, I just finished a paper which I'm having publishing, published on uh, carbon emissions and uh, what portfolio managers could do to actually uh, mitigate the effects of uh, carbon emissions on their portfolio. So I just finished that paper. A lot of people talk about the idea of excluding securities from a portfolio to increase the cost of capital for those who are polluters, such as coal companies and oil companies. And others talk about cajoling or engaging with them or voting them to move faster to decarbonize their portfolios and a lot of economics doesn't know how to distinguish between those are going fast enough and those going not fast enough and going knowing what the effects on the cost of capital might be. So a solution that I came up with is actually using your portfolio management skills in your team to source and buy and manage good carbon credits and to decarbonize the portfolio. So make your portfolio carbon neutral. And as a result of that, by buying carbon credits, the price of carbon credits might increase, which incentivize as firms then to move more quickly to decarbonize on their own if they are being slackered and not doing it as quickly as might be deemed um, something they should be doing by society. 
Um, I, I hope I'm still getting to work in the lab five years from now, and I hope that I get my schedule more sensible, that I'm at least half time here um, working with students in my lab. I still, the, my favorite part of the job is still to go in the lab and, and try to get things to work. So um, we're now opening the floor for questions from the audience. If there is a question that you have that hasn't been answered yet, we encourage and invite you all. There's mics on that side and that side. Um, and so any volunteers? Well, OK, so I was doing my PhD, which is the Nobel Prize winning time. Um, I did work all the time. I mean, I actually, I remember sitting one night at the co where the coffee was underneath the stairs at the laser lab and uh, the custodian came by and asked if he could ask a private or question. And I said, go ahead. And he, goes, and he asked if I was married, which I thought was a very strange question. And I, and I said, no, I'm not married. And he goes, well, you know, if my wife told me she was going out working every night, I wouldn't believe it, but you're always here. <laughs> I go, yeah, I guess that's why I'm not married. Um, but since then, I would say I've always made sure I had a life, work-life balance. I was, I was home having dinner with my kids every night. I didn't, I mean, there were times, uh, and my daughter still knows that I missed her very first dance recital because I was out at a conference, but mostly I tried to uh, have a good work-life balance. Thank you. Yes, so it is quite often just the professor that wins the Nobel Prize and not the students who have done the work. Um, and so it was a difference for mine. And so we, and we won't know. I sometimes wonder if, you know, Gerard helped me get a Nobel Prize or because I was the woman, I helped him get a Nobel Prize. We won't know. Um, but yeah, I think, I, I think even though, you know, Einstein and I'll even throw out these quips, like he's, you know, a person who did so much physics all on his own. But I think if you look at it, there's all these many letters. They had to do everything by letters back and forth, right? But um, there was a lot of conversations back and forth about what the various science things meant. And, and the whole point of conferences is for us to get together and, and uh, discuss our ideas to see what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. So it's, it's not very fair to say that it's one thing. I mean, CPA is, is getting um, heralded, but of course there's so many um, people on this long chain of, that made it possible. Um, when people ask, you know, did you know it was gonna be so well known? I said, well, really, if Peter Moulton hadn't invented titanium dope sapphire at the same time as we were doing this, it would not be the popular laser that it is, you know? And then I get asked, why did you use a fiber? Why didn't you use a grading stretcher? And I said, because a grading stretcher was invented in 1987 and I did this work in 1984. So you forget over the years how many things were done to make something go, and, it's, and we're all just one link in a long chain um, from that point of view. Uh, but also, again, it's usually a group, and it's usually that they are discussing it while they're in the lab or if theorists get together in a room and, and hash things out where things happen. So we do have to celebrate that more. Well, I don't know that I would like it to be anything in particular. Um, it's just always a wow thing to see when it happens that there's another breakthrough. So, um, you know, the only things I could talk about now are the ones that people are trying for, which is obviously not going to be the big next breakthrough. It's something none of us have thought about yet. Um, but I would still like to see a deeper understanding beyond, you know, what is quantum mechanics? Because I think we're not at the end. I think we think we're sort of there. But I mean, you know, even though I'm not an astrophysicist, I'd maybe like to know what dark matter is because that's like 95% of us and we don't even know what the heck it is. So that'd be good. So those would be the ones that I think would be good to know. Right now it's my um, schedule. Um, how to fit everything in and the fact that I'm even missing Thanksgiving this weekend is upsetting me. Uh, so we're talking about work-life balance. Um, the greatest challenge uh, I don't have, you know, I've had such a lovely little life that um, uh, challenges aren't my big thing. Um, I, I've led a charmed life. So, yeah, I think the only challenge will be, you know, looking forward is do I retire or do I never retire? I don't know. And so I wonder about that. But I, mostly I just want to get off the nonstop travel uh, soon and be back in the lab. That's my challenge.
Hmm. Well, I, don't, I mean, it's funny. When I first saw a CPA laser um, on a trade floor, you know, I couldn't believe it was even engineered. Those of us back in the day, you know, we, and, and people have made a lot of fun of me saying I'm a laser jock, and I don't even know why we used the term, but I think it's because we also felt we were good with our hands. Um, and it was not easy to make our lasers work, right? Uh, now they're turnkey and anyone can have a laser. Um, and so I just remember going to the laser trade show and seeing a CPA for the first time. Now my husband gave the poor salesman a really hard time because I just went and said, I, I was hoping they would take the lid off it. If you ever go to trade show, you'll find out they never want to take the lid off because you don't get to know their trade secrets. Um, because I just wanted to see how they could have engineered it well enough that it would be useful. Mine only worked about 5% of the time, right? Um, and uh, the guy just wanted to keep explaining CPA to me and, and my husband kept saying, yes, why don't you explain to Donna Strickland, you know, how CPA works. Um, yeah, no, and it was, the guy felt bad because he didn't understand the whole thing. Um, so I just remember being amazed that the something I built was even for sale, you know? Um, but I think going forward, the thing I would like to see happen with it is a laser particle acceleration. I think it is one of the main things that are being, um, it's being looked at with it, both at the highest end to try to even maybe beat CERN one day using laser acceleration, but all the way down. Toshi Tajima, who's the one who invented laser wake field acceleration, um, he wants to work with me and use the fiber laser that I'm developing in my lab right now to see if we can't just do laser acceleration on a small scale at the end of a fiber to go down and maybe do radiation treatment on something that's um, would be on the organ that the um, fiber tip would get right to. So anywhere in that whole scale, I would like to see lasers use, my CPA use for that. Well, I never had the goal to get a Nobel Prize, so that wasn't one of my goals. So I don't know that my goals have changed. I like to know that I can get up each day and do something that I want to do. Um, and so, like I said, I'm building this new laser and hopefully I'll see laser acceleration. Although I contacted a colleague at uh, Germany to ask if he understood if there would be a photonic crystal fiber to do the compression that I want because he invented photonic crystal fibers. And he said, oh, funny you should say that's your application because I'm working with Wim Lehmann's on, the, on that exact same thing. And I went, oh my gosh, I'm miles behind. I'm never going to catch up. So obviously I would like to catch up and, and get it to work. So yeah, no, it's, my goals never change. But Thank you so much. Um, yeah, no, well, obviously I had a great time here. Uh, it, it, you know, so I, my first year I was at Molten Hall, and I still remember um, in the middle of the night being woken up to do one of those dance, frosh dances, and the guys from K Hall came in. And it turned out that, like, and we just got partnered. We came down the stairs, they came in, and we got partnered and went downstairs and danced. And it turned out to be the number one guy in engineering that I ended up being partnered with. Um, and it worked out great f for us, you know, so we both talked about um, engineering and most likely going into engineering physics because we were just first year engineering. Um, and so he became my lab partner. And I still remember, um, so after first year, I know he's the number one guy in all of uh, engineering. And so second year, sort of like dating, but not really, but it was sort of like, mm, is he still going to want to be my lab partner? Because now he's number one, and who might might want to be his lab partner. How do I, you know, feel out the waters there? And um, so it was second year E&M. And as I'm walking in the door, someone is asking him to be lab partner. And he says, no, I already have a lab partner. And I'm thinking, oh. And then he sees me, goes, oh, here she is. I went, oh, good, I'm still his lab partner. <laughs> um, so that worked out really well. And we were lab partners all four years. Um, mostly because um, he and I had the same approach to it, which is not the, so I, just so you know, I came fourth in my class. Um, and so he was first in Intrus and I was fourth. And the number two and three were lab partners together because they were the type that had, you know, dot every I and cross every T, and Trich and I were not. So <laughs> Trich and I had a much different, let's, let's just, you know, do the fun parts and forget the rest. Um, so I, I remember that. Um, I, I remember senior sciences. These are the weird things you remember. Senior sciences, I don't know if it's still the same, right? It was like, well, you guys don't call it senior sciences, so you have to know what building this is, but it's over there um, behind engineering. Um, and so they used to have this lovely thing, which I doubt exists anymore, like a coffee room. It just so, it was, there was a, always a woman there selling coffee and donuts and stuff like that, and then couches that so you could sit around coffee tables and, and have that. 
Um, and for some reason, we were always in those rooms beside there. So it was that you'd have a class and then you'd run and get your coffee and your donut and you'd sit around on the couches for a while. I remember running for Enchfiz president when I was um, at, at, at the Enchfiz far race, which also probably can't happen now that the drinking age went up and down and all the rest, because um, uh, there was a few incidents. Um, yeah, I, I have a lot of memories. But yeah, no, it was fun. Thank you. I was, I'll ask you to, uh, <laughs> Um, the, the, almost near the ver very end, Trich is sitting beside me in this one class and he's starting to write really tiny, like, you know, he was a strange duck, we were all strange ducks. And, and I started to think to myself, I said, I don't always sit with you. Which classes do I sit with you? And then I went back through the whole four years and realized that we always sat together in the toughest classes. And I think it was subconsciously, you know, but uh, Trich and I were really the two that were always right with the prof. And when he made a mistake, we would look at each other. Um, but Trich never wanted to put up his hand to say, um, that's wrong, right? But if he looked at me and we looked together at each other, then I knew that there was a mistake and I would put up my hand and say, that's wrong. Um, just so that people would stop, because everybody else was still busy um, taking notes. Um, and so the, these are the things that I remember. And did you become the president of EngFizz or? Yeah, I was the president of EngFizz, yes. Awesome, congrats. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>
and turn it into what you want it to do. But otherwise, I don't know. I think it's quite often the choices are made for you more than you make the choice. Your choice is to make the best of it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> So uh, we have come to the end of our time together today. I want to thank all of you in attendance for your participation and for those of you that came up and asked questions. I'd also like to express what an honor it is to share the stage with you today. And thank you so much for coming back and it's wonderful to have you back on campus. I think I speak for all of us when I say what an inspiration it is to have you in our alumni network and part of our McMaster family. Um, thank you for sharing your insights and reflections, and we look forward to seeing you back on campus again soon. <laughs> um, so please join me in thanking Dr. Strickland for coming today. Thank you.